This week, the essay commemorates the Italian painter Caravaggio, who died four centuries ago, in July 1610. Innovative and tempestuous in his lifetime, the artist remains intriguing today. Tonight's introductory portrait of Caravaggio is by John Gash, senior lecturer in the history of art at the University of Aberdeen. Caravaggio has intrigued the modern imagination perhaps more than any old master. For me, this has to do with the fact that his pictures have an existential edge and an alienated quality that must have been as riveting in his own time as they are today. His intense tone and radical artistic agenda, evident both in the half-length genre paintings with still life, with which he first made a living after moving from his native Milan to Rome in 1592, and in the darkly dramatic religious paintings, which clinched his reputation on the eve of the new century, are rooted in his personality, encapsulated in his patron, Cardinal Del Monte's comment that he was extremely capricious. He is unpredictable nature, aggressive behaviour and bohemian way of life have fuelled the modern sense of him as an embattled outsider who channelled the complexities of his own make-up into an assertively iconoclastic art. It was an art on the edge that, drawing on the naturalistic traditions of his native Lombardy and nearby Venice, as seen in the works of Savoldo, Moretto, Leonardo and Titian, but concentrating them provocatively in his quest for increased clarity and honesty, sought to supplant the highly artificial mannerism that dominated Roman and Florentine art with a new kind of hyperrealism. While the core of Caravaggio's career saw him pursuing this objective in Rome, in an uneasy alliance with the Counter-Reformation Catholic Church, which was both drawn to and repelled by the often contradictory nature of his vision, he was forced to flee the city in 1606 after killing a man and spent the last four years of his life in the south. In Naples, where he still gained patronage despite being under capital sentence in Rome, next in Malta, where he became a knight of the international military come medical order, the Knights of St. John or Knights Hospitaller, painting for them his largest and most grimly compelling altarpiece, the beheading of their patron Saint John the Baptist, before fleeing to Sicily after attacking a senior knight and gravitating back to Naples. We do not know the precise details of his final coastal journey north in 1610 and his death in the Tuscan town of Porto Ercole on July the 18th, though it's possible he was travelling to Florence to meet some of the patrons he'd known in Malta prior to a return to Rome, since negotiations were underway for a pardon. But the mesmerising tone of Caravaggio's art is also the product of a technical and creative virtuosity forged in his struggle to reposition the twin aims of Renaissance art, imitating nature and perfecting style. He introduced two revolutionary procedures, painting rather than first drawing directly from the posed model and constructing a system of illumination which used bold contrasts of light and shade, chiaroscuro, to intensify drama and invest it with real presence. Michelangelo Merisi, later to use the name Caravaggio after his ancestral home east of Milan, was born in Milan itself on the feast day of his namesake the Archangel Michael, 29th of September 1571, the son of Fermo Merisi, architect to the Marquis of Caravaggio. He must have been touched by the fervent counter-reformation climate of the city under Cardinal Carlo Borromeo, whose crusading care of the poor and sick would later resonate in the unblinking view of human suffering that Caravaggio brought to his religious canvases. He was apprenticed in Milan for four years on the 6th of April 1584 to the Bergamasque painter Simone Petezano, a pupil of Titian, and learned from Petezano the highly finished, descriptive technique and love of detail that would underpin his own practice. My own fascination with Caravaggio began on a visit to Florence at the age of 18. Armed with a copy of Sartre's novel Nausea, I found myself drawn in the Uffizi less to the beatific Renaissance canvases of Leonardo and Botticelli than to a small group of very direct and in two cases extremely violent paintings by Caravaggio. These were three pictures currently on display till October in the major exhibition in the Uffizi and Pitti Palace, Caravaggio e Caravaggeschi a Firenze. The decapitated, screaming head of the Greek mythological Gorgon, Medusa, on a convex wooden shield. 
the Roman god of wine, Bacchus, half undressed, offering a glass of wine and perhaps more to the viewer as he toys with a black velvet bow tied round his index finger, and Abraham, his right wrist firmly gripped by a muscular angel as he's about to cut the throat of his screaming son, Isaac, set in the lyrical half-light of a wintry landscape. What was it about these pictures that seemed to reflect better than any other my somewhat morose adolescent mood? Their apparent sense of futility, or also, as I now think, their strong sense of existence itself and of action, of existence preceding essence in Sartre's terms, and of liberation through action. Visually, they achieve their effects through a lingering observation of detail, combined with an emphatic choice of moment, which give them a photographic air. It's no accident that comparisons have been made with the neorealist films of Pasolini. Apart from having been an admirer of Caravaggio's art, Pasolini's homosexuality may have attracted him to Caravaggio's early half-lengths painted directly from boys who smack of the demimonde, ragazzi di vita. Whether it be the Uffizi Bacchus or the Borghese Gallery's boy with a basket of fruit, simultaneously proffering and clutching a basket of fruit, his mouth half open in speech or a sigh. The evidence for Caravaggio's homosexuality is equivocal, but it may be that his attentive scrutiny of the appearance of the boys with curly hair, whom he transmuted into poetic allegories of music or the senses, into nude cupids and adolescent St John the Baptists, was on a par with Pasolini's quest for living flesh-and-blood characters, with all the contradictions that that implies, as in his use of a non-actor, Ettore Garofolo, a modern working-class boy with a basket, in his 1962 film Mamma Roma. Indeed, what draw the viewer are the disparate elements of the observed and experienced that Caravaggio lards into his pictures, unifying them only superficially into a living tableau with bold placements, gestures and lighting, as well sometimes as the ultimate realistic flourish of implied sound. 